Good morning. Good morning. All right, so as you can see, uh, we're a little uh, short banded this morning, so we want to hear you loud and proud this morning. Did we? We didn't get the, the words up there this morning. All right, so this is a newer song. Hopefully, you've all heard this on Caleb at some place. And, oh, there it is. All right. Whew. Please stand and join us.
Amen. All right, let's take this uh, time to pass the peace and, and greet one another. So just a couple announcements this morning. Uh, it is Communion Sunday, so we will be having communion this morning. Don't forget about the Youth Conference, March 12th. Again, they're looking for all the help that they can get for the Youth Conference. So please pray about that and, uh, and consider helping with that. And then, uh, you know, prayers to all those that are, are uh, struggling, sick, uh, still fighting the crud. Um, that's affected our band too, so we just will keep all of them in our prayers day. Do we have other announcements for the good of the cause this morning? All right, well, let's praise the Lord.
Try that again. Anybody hear anything I just said? Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to say it again then. He broke the bread, he gave it to him, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's an interesting phrase, and literally the disciples did not know what was going on. And we can relate to that. They know then after the fact, his death, his burial, his resurrection, they understood that he gave his life, he shed his blood, he rose from the dead, and then they got it. After they broke the bread, he took the cup, and he drank from it, and he gave it to them, and this is what he said, drink of it, all of you, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. New covenant is a key word there. In other words, what Jesus was saying, there's no more bulls or goats or pigeons or doves or birds going to the temple to make sacrifice to cover the sin. My blood will be the final sacrifice that takes away the sin. It's the new covenant. When you confess to believe in Jesus Christ, your sin is gone. The old person is dead, the new person is resurrected to do new life. Drink of it, all of you in remembrance of what I have done for you. If you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're welcome to come to the table. In fact, we encourage you to. Because of what he said. It's through this meal, then, that we come to the table and we remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. And we praise him for it. That he took away sin, conquered death, rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven, is seated today at the right hand of the Father. And he intercedes for us continuously. What a gift. If you've got children under the age 14, 15, where you don't know for sure, that's between you and your children. If they've confessed to believe, we invite them to the table. That's between you as a parent with your child to have that conversation. So as we prepare our hearts today, let's open with prayer. Uh, we'll come up and get ready to serve your communion and you feel free to come when you're ready. Father, we, we say thank you today with hearts that literally cannot fully comprehend, but we receive it by faith. We believe in the resurrection. We know the tomb is empty. We believe in the blood that was shed, the perfect blood, the Lamb of God that was given. We believe that through your life, your death, your resurrection, you have conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave for us today. So Father, let, let them who have ears hear the power that's in this meal. We confess and we believe and we receive and we come forward and we, we take this in our hands and we ingest it into us. It's a reminder that you put your spirit into us and I'm one with you. We praise you for it. 
Father, remind us today of the power of our salvation. We've been moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, and we praise you for it. Father, I pray for every person here today and those who are communing at home. This is not an act that you gave us to be taken lightly, but we take it seriously, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name, we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You can come forward when you're ready.
Children's Church, I think they're already out the door. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of communion, a time of intimacy between us and you and our spiritual connection with you, a reminder, an intense reminder of the depth of our salvation. I pray now that through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit that our ears are open to hear, our hearts are willing to receive your word, and we ask that this sanctuary be filled beyond our understanding with your presence and let us be moved into a position to claim victory in Jesus' name and no longer live under the lies of the enemy that he continually puts forth, but to be set free in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We, we get excited to come to worship, don't we? It, it, it's excited to come into the fellowship and to, to share, to commune, to come around the Word of God. You know that about me and I know that about you. That's why we're here today. And everybody said, amen. amen. We're going to come into the Word today and we're going to launch into a couple of weeks and we're going to talk about your wounds. Where have you been hurt? Where have you been hurt so deeply that you're not willing to let it go. Now sometimes, or many times in life, it can be through an illness, it can be through a death, it can be through financial crisis, it can be from what someone said to you, it can be from an, an affair in the marriage, it can be any sorts of the above, but we're going to talk about the wounds that we carry and how do we get rid of it. There's a difference between a wound and a scar, and today I want to talk about both, and who you are, where you are, and why are you continually carrying this wound. And we all have them. They're all real. And sometimes we don't know how to get rid of it. So today we're going to start at the beginning, and we're just going to lay a few things out there. We're going to lay the foundation to get you to a position to say, Hallelujah, Jesus came to set the captives free. And we don't want you living with the baggage and the bondage of these wounds that you're still dragging around. And, and you got an open wound, you're bleeding out, literally. So Romans chapter 3, verse 23 is where we're going to start all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I have parentheses there, sinned is a noun. This is, this is what you're born into. This, this is the greatest wound that can ever be inflicted upon you. And it was upon you. You didn't do anything to earn or deserve this condition, yet you're born into a world, you're separated from God as a person, not your actions, as a person, you're born into a world without a relationship to God the Father. All were born into it. We all fall short of the glory of God. Jesus comes on the scene. Now, some of this is going to be old news for you, but I'm going to keep pounding away at this as long as I'm in the ministry because people fail to grab this. Jesus came on the scene, and this is what he says. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven. Who was the kingdom of heaven? Jesus Christ himself. He's standing right in front of the people and he says, look it, the kingdom of heaven is here. It's at hand. Repent. How do we get into the kingdom of heaven and get rid of that great big wound that we're born into? Nicodemus searched Jesus out and this is what he says. Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. There's our kingdom again. This kingdom is Jesus' ministry. He came to restore the kingdom. See is a verb here that means to see with an understanding who Jesus is and what he's teaching. You got, you got a math problem on the page and you see the numbers. But this see is you see the numbers and you know the answer. So he says, unless you look at me and know who I am, you're never going to get into that kingdom. And Nicodemus said, very realistic, how can a man be born when he is old? 
Can he enter the second time into a mother's womb and be born? Legitimate question. He's, he's thinking in the physical. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, there's our water baptism you learned about last week, unless you come through the water, receive me as in the spirit, he cannot enter the what? The kingdom of God. I'm born into the world, and, and we've used this illustration for some time now, my left side, dark world, separated from God. Nicodemus says, I want to be in whatever you have. In order to be into my kingdom, you must be born of water and of the Spirit, and now the old wound is healed. Don't miss that. A born-again believer, that wound of being separated from God is over. You're a brand new person. You're in the kingdom of the light. All brand new. You're a born again believer. You now walk in the kingdom of light. It drives me nuts. I, I love the song. I don't have anything about, against the song. I'll, someday I'll fly away. And they sing it at funerals. You know, as if I'm born into the kingdom of light, I confess to believe, but someday I'll be in the kingdom of light. Seriously, when I confess to believe, I have been moved into the kingdom of light here on this side of glory. Hallelujah. I'm not going to fly away someday. I'm here. That's where he's moved us to, into the kingdom of light. Now, let's switch gears. That's a person. That's the born-again person. We're going to talk about your wounds today as a person that is a verb. What are the actions that have been done to you or actions that you have done that caused you to become very wounded? And you're in the kingdom of light. You're a born-again believer. And we know that you cannot become unborn and go back to the kingdom of darkness, right? You, you don't go back and forth. You're in the kingdom of light, but you have had something happen to you for you to become very critical. Angry, defensive, judgmental, guilt-ridden. But yet you're in the kingdom of light. What did Jesus say? I came to set the captives free. And you're over here. Oh, I confess to believe in a, I'm Jesus and you're confessing to be a Christian, but you're living with an open wound in the kingdom of dark. Why? If you confess to believe and receive Jesus Christ, you, you don't live in the kingdom of dark. You don't have wounds. You may have a wound for a night, but guess what? Joy comes in the morning, David says. There might be weeping for a night. There's a period, but confess it. Receive the blood of Jesus. The wound is healed. Some of you here today and some of you listening to this are living with an open wound. And it's detrimental. In fact, it's so detrimental, it stopped you from going forward and being useful in the kingdom of God. And yet the Holy Spirit is saying, did Jesus die for this sin? Did, did, he, did he take care of this? Why, why do you continue to carry it? David is on top of his, his palace. He's in the kingdom of light. Him and Yahweh, God, are tight. Scripture says he's a man after God's own heart. It's the only person in Scripture that ever gets that title. And yet in his physical, in his ability to make a mistake, he looks at Bathsheba and he not only likes what he sees, but he wants what he sees. And he commits adultery. He has his, his servants go get her and bring her and they were together. He committed adultery to the point that it continued that she was pregnant and now he's got a problem and her husband was a general in the army and David is like, you know what, we got to get this dude home and, and he can have supper and sleep with his wife and get me off the hook. He's in the kingdom of light and he's making a bad mistake. And he brings him home and, and he is such a dedicated general. He says, I will not sleep with my wife. I will not even eat with her. I'm going to sleep on the street by the front door of our house because my men are out there fighting a battle. David is stuck between a rock and a hard place. He recommissions him to the front line where he knows he's going to get killed. He commits murder. Yet he's in the kingdom of light. He's with Yahweh God. <coughs> 
When you're in the kingdom of light and you make a grievous error, this is what David says about it. Blessed is the one who, Psalm 32, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Notice David has to use the words covered because in the Old Testament, the sin's not taken away. It's covered by the blood of the animals. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there's no deceit. So blessed is the guy, you know, And then he says this in verse 3. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away, though my groaning, through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of the summer. David's acknowledging he's in the kingdom. And I, I made a mistake. And in that process, when I didn't confess that sin, it's like the hand of God is upon me. He's bringing me to that place of repentance. My strength is dried up. It's like in the heat of the summer. I don't like living like this. In another psalm, he says it's as as if all my bones are broken. Imagine the agony of living with a wound. And we have people today that live with a wound. And you can honestly confess what he just said. Life becomes very detrimental. It's hard to go through. Your hands upon me day and night. Not to hurt you, brother, but to bring you to the conscious awareness that you need to change. And then in verse 5 he says this, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not, and I did not cover my iniquity. In other words, when he was in this position, oh my God, my God, I finally confessed it to you. And it was lifted from him. He didn't want to live with the wound any longer. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I'll confess my transgression to the Lord. And you forgave me the iniquity of my sin. Did David lose his salvation? No. Do you lose your salvation when the action happens? No. If you do, then you're going back to the kingdom of dark and you have to crawl out of the womb, as as Nicodemus said. You're still in the kingdom of light. But he says, if you have a wound, I want you to confess it, not to get saved again, but to receive the blessing of me so that you and I can be tight again, so that we don't have this wound in between us. Does that make sense? You you ever been in a relationship where something comes in between? And there's tension there. (coughs) What's wrong with you today? Nothing. You having a bad day? No, I'm happy, happy, happy. (laughs) I mean, you've all been there. The person at work. And it's like, really? Who bit you today? (laughs) We, We experience this. And it's because they will not confess the wound. And the longer it goes on, the more your identity becomes that person I just described. And pretty soon your identity becomes the person who is sideways, the person who is short. Well, that's just the way they are. It's probably because they're in the kingdom, they're confessible, they're good people. But they got a wound. And it's bleeding. And it doesn't go away. And they become short. They become angry. Jesus Jesus says, I want you to stay there. I want you to live in that penalty of your actions. I want you to suffer. No, Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus is grace. Jesus is mercy. He says, listen, I died so you don't have to do this. But I'm going to teach you something today that takes it one step further. It gets a whole lot better than just dying and taking me out of this. Leviticus 6 verses 1 through 6 God's teaching Moses, and they're talking about the sacrifices to be given when something happens, when there's a wound that happens. And this is what he teaches Moses. He says, if anyone sins and commits a breach of faith against the Lord by deceiving his brother in the matter of deposit or security. So you go to the bank, you got a hundred bucks to put in the bank, and the banker records 80. He kept 20 bucks. In the matter of deposit or security. Through robbery. Or if he has oppressed his neighbor. He said some bad things about his neighbor. Or has found something lost and he lied about it. Swearing falsely. In any of all the things that people do and sin thereby. 
Verse 4, if he has sinned and has realized his guilt and will restore what he took by robbery or what he got by oppression, you know, he just talked bad about his neighbor long enough, uh, got him all depressed and gave him what he wanted, or deposit, the banker was corrupt, that was committed to him or lost the thing that he found, or anything about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore it in full and add a fifth to it. See, this is a picture of Jesus. The Old Testament is a type and shadow of the things to come. That's what the Old Testament, everything in the Old Testament lines up with the New Testament. It's a type and shadow of the things to come. He's going to restore a fifth and give it to him whom it belongs on the day he realizes his guilt. And he shall bring to the priest as his compensation to the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flock or its equivalent for a guilt offering. Whoo, hallelujah, this gets so fun. Who's the ram? Jesus. He's the offering. Who's the one who's been robbing from us? The devil. Jesus came on the scene and he conquered the one who's been stealing his kids from him. And not only that, but he says, when you confess to believe and receive me, I'm going to cause him to repay you more than what he took from you in the beginning. Do you ever learn that before? A fifth more. And people say, oh, my God's an awesome God. You don't know how awesome your God is. He's the ram who died. He's the one that goes to the devil himself. And when there's been an offense committed to you, he says, you're going to repay her back 20% more. And in God's economy, Jesus doesn't put terms on it in the New Testament. His grace is more than enough. Have you ever heard that phrase? Well, yeah, it's because I got an extra 10 bucks in the mail the other day. No, his grace is more than enough. Ginger and I are farming in those days and we got four oxen. Somebody comes over and steals our four oxen. How many do we get back? Five. Hallelujah. I got robbed and I got more back. That's our God. That's our God. So you're over here in, in the guilt wound and you're willing to carry that. And God says, if you give it up and let me heal you, I'm going to repay you more than what was stolen from you. And I'm not going to do it. I'm going to have the devil do it. Never thought about that before, have you? It's called the redistribution of wealth. God does this all the time. He moves money around. He heals people. It's the redistribution of wealth. And that's how he works. That's our God. Bigger than anything we could ever imagine. Yet we're willing to keep the wound. We're willing to stay stuck. You don't know what happened to me in 1987, Pastor. I don't care what happened to you in 1987. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died. And he went to the cross, and he was the ram that was sacrificed. He is going to pay me back more than enough if I'm willing. Right after the Lord's Prayer, when you read Matthew chapter 6, immediately following the Lord's Prayer, This is what it says, that if you don't forgive the sins of others, I can't forgive you. And he's not talking about salvation there. He's talking about the wound. He said, if you can't offer forgiveness like I just forgave you, then you're going to have to live in your mess. And I came here to tell you today, I don't want you living in your mess anymore. Jesus doesn't want you living in your mess. He wants you to know that you can be restored 20% more than enough. More than enough. I want you to identify with your wound right now. What what are you making the conscious decision to continue to carry? And it's literally hurting you. And he says, I died so that I could be the sacrifice, so I can give you more than enough back. And here's our story, John 20. This this is a guy of a wound carrier. His name is Thomas. Thomas. Jesus appears on the first day. And by the way, nobody expected Jesus to come back to life. When you read the Gospels, you ever catch that? I mean, he preached, he taught, I'm going to lay in the tomb for three days, I'm going to resurrect. And what did the women do on Sunday morning? They went to prepare his body as if he was still there. He wasn't there. 
He rose, he tells the girls to go tell the disciples. They go tell the disciples. Peter and John race to the tomb. Well, this can't be true. They go and look. There's no Jesus. And we get to the nighttime and Jesus appears. Thomas isn't there. He says, I'm not going to believe. But Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin. And what does twin mean here? Twin means Didymus in the Greek language. He did not have a twin brother. He had twin personalities. Some people say that he was bipolar. But Didymus means twin. I believe when you read twin in the Greek and you put it into the context, he, he was conflicted in the physical and the spiritual. He was a twin in nature, wondering what to do. Twin was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. I don't believe it unless I see it in his hands and the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I'll never believe. You know how many people, born-again believer, good people, they've been hurt, and they keep that open wound. I don't believe Jesus can heal me. And they've never been taught that Jesus has already healed you. And they go through their whole life with the pain and the agony of whatever happened to them in their childhood, whatever happened to them somewhere, and, and they go through their whole life. I don't know if Jesus can really do this for me. And that was Thomas. Eight days later, Jesus waited a week. His disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, I can't wait to go to heaven. I can't. He's in physical form. He ate with these guys. He walked with these guys. The doors were locked, and guess what? There he was. I mean, somehow the, the molecular structure of our bodies in heaven has the ability to go right through that wall. I can't wait for that. It's just, it's just so cool. That's who we're going to be. We, we're, we're above matter. Anyway, there he was. And, and he says, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Folks, I believe Thomas was here, but he had this wound that he died. And by gosh, I'm upset about it. You know, we followed this guy, we listened to this guy, we watched this guy, he's going to bring in the new kingdom, and now he's dead. And I, I'm not going to buy this thing unless I get to touch it. And here's what I don't want you to miss. Jesus wanted to restore him more than enough, but he did not show him his wound. What did he show him? His scars. Jesus didn't walk into that room bleeding out of his side, gaping, bleeding hands and bleeding feet. He said, put your hand here in my side. Touch me in my scars. I went to the cross. I was wounded. Your sin wounded me. The sin of all the world wounded me to the point it killed me. And I went into the grave and I came out of that grave with a scar. Why? Because I've been healed in my Father's name. I've been resurrected from the dead. I don't carry the wound anymore. The sin killed me. But the Father resurrected me so that you can see my scar. And I don't want you carrying that wound any longer, Thomas. You see it? If you're still in the wound, you're still in the non-believing state saying, I don't know what Jesus did. But when you're over here and you see Jesus' scars and you see his hands, they're scars. And you know what the problem is? The church teaches wounded. I have a problem against organized religion. You know that. I wrote a paper in seminary. I said, in my lifetime, I will see the death of all denominations. And we're walking towards that. The reason I have somewhat of a problem, not with all of them, but with some of them, is because they teach wounded. 
They, they want you to stay in the pain. They want you to stay stuck. They want you to stay hurting. So you grovel back into the pew on Sunday morning, put a little money in the plate. Oh, I feel good for an hour. And by the next Sunday, you come groveling back again. My gosh, my Bible says that Jesus came to set the captives free. Amen. He came to take care of the wound that you were born with. He came to take care of the wound that you have struggled with. And he came to show you his scar. And you've been listening to somebody that says, you're no good. You'll never get over the death. You'll never get over the affair. You know what that guy did to you when you were a little girl? You never have to forgive him because that was an offense and it was done to you. And by gosh, and who, who's telling you you're no good? Who's telling you that you can't be forgiven? Who's telling you that you're still in the kingdom of dark? The devil himself. Why do you listen to him and not the Holy Spirit? Amen? Amen. Who's telling you the lies? Come on, folks. you got to be aware of this. The offense can happen. You can have the wound, but I'm in the kingdom of light. And by gosh, I confess my sin. I come before God. And he says, now you got a scar. So at Grace Fellowship, we want you to come in this place and pull up your sleeves. Let's see your scars. I'm not going to preach wounded. Nobody else is going to tell you wounded. I've, I got scars. We got teenagers that cut themselves today. I encountered a girl 15 years ago who didn't have a blade to cut herself with, so she took her eraser of her pencil and erased her skin till it bled. And we want people to come in. We don't want to see the wounds. We want you to keep the wound. Put on your nice clothes and your little necktie and come into church and sit in the pew and be all nice. And how are you doing today? I'm fine. And inside we're dying. Because we don't want to see the wounds. And yet Jesus says, bring it all to me. Because when you confess it, I'm going to heal it because I died for you. And we come into a fellowship. We want to take the shirt off. We want to see the arm. We want to see your scars. You know what? Because your scars tell a story. And we get to share life together. We know where each other have been. We've all been down a road. We all have pain and we all have stories. But by gosh, when we can show the scars, that's when we're healed. That's when life gets real. That's when it's like, oh man, look at what Jesus did for you. Look, you want to hear what he did to me? You want to? And we get to share that. That's what he did with Thomas. And whatever you have, whatever the lie has been holding you, listen, it's as if the nails of Christ are still holding you. Is there still nails in Jesus' hands? No. He's got the scars. He's got the place to prove it. You got the scars. You got, you know what? I went through hell in 1990 in the divorce. It hurt. But my God's bigger than that. I went through a period of depression when my best friend died. But my God's bigger than that. I ended up with a wound, but you know what? Jesus turned it into a scar. And I've been healed in Jesus' name. And I get to live with that. I get to live in that freedom. He did it for me. There's no more nails. Stop listening to the devil. He's not a, a, an imagination. He's not some weird thing that's out there. He's real. And he wants to keep you in your wound. He wants to keep you separated from Jesus. The essence of God is that I died and I restored you and I'm going to pay you back through the craziness of this world because you confess to believe in me and I'm going to restore you completely through this process. Yes, you got wounds, but by gosh, we're going to show our scars because that's my God. That's my Jesus. So whatever the nails are that are holding you today, I'm going to close this time for, for you to come before God and say, hey, I've, I've let that wound be open way too long. There's no more nails holding me. Tell, tell yourself, let go of the nails. Let, let go of the nails and, and let that wound be healed and, and embrace the scar. You know what? Our past defines our future. We use our past as a springboard to launch us forward. We can't deny past. Past is real. And we can't just say, I can forget it. 
No, I got a scar here that says I went through it. And let it drive you forward and receive what Jesus has for you. Tell yourself, when the devil comes to hammer in that nail, get behind me, Satan. My God died and he conquered you. You're under my feet. You're behind me. You're over. I'm walking forward in Jesus' name. I have nothing to do with you. Get him, Jesus. And he's already has. That's how great our God is. More than enough. He's going to restore more than enough. Amen? Amen. I'm going to open with prayer, and I'm going to let you go before the Lord. Uh, the scars that you're still carrying, whatever's wounded you, if you still got a wound, maybe today's the day. As David said, I confessed it, and it was released. And I got to begin a new life. Father, We praise you for who you are today. Some of the people sitting here today have waited a long time to let this wound be turned into a scar. Father, some of the people walking and living a life in the kingdom in the kingdom of God, confessing to be a born-again believer, yet in the midst of that, the enemy is still holding them down. So Father, let the hearts be turned today to confess the reality, acknowledging who you are. You came to set us free and to confess the grievance that caused the wound and you just step right into that situation and you heal it, you restore it. And we receive that grace that's more than enough. I give you a time to, to fill in your blank, your wound that you're still carrying. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you're a God that does not condemn. Thank you for the presence of the Spirit that convicts. We thank you for the wounds that were healed today. We thank you your presence in this fellowship, Father. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, as the people leave here today and those watching, as, as the enemy brings it up to us again by tomorrow noon or Wednesday afternoon, no, no. My wound's been healed in Jesus' name. I'm not carrying these nails. Get behind me, Satan. Father, empower him to say in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Your grace is more than enough and you're repaying us more than what we could ever imagine and we thank you for it. Heal the marriages in this fellowship, Father. Heal the families. Heal the children. Protect our children. Heal our community. May your presence be in our schools and with the teachers in our churches. And we pray for all of the people in the community and those who are, are part of this fellowship and those who watch that if there is a lack of understanding of how powerful Jesus is to confess, to believe into him today and receive him. We pray for salvation. You've brought us to be a light in this town and in this world and we're going to be obedient to it. 
praise you, Jesus. We're going to walk and we're not going to get tired. We're going to mount up like the eagles and we're going to fly and we're going to bring the good news as long as we can and as long as we're called to until that trumpet blows. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. In the powerful name of Jesus, everybody said, Amen. Let's stand. Sunset falls upon your days and fades throughout the west as evening comes and lulls your souls to rest. May you follow the light, may you walk in the light in God's kingdom. 
May you be in relationship with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and his Father. Go in peace. Amen.